it's uh, Thursday again, so it's all very early. And we can start by looking at the feedback from the last lecture, which is a very marked shift from the first two lectures, which were all like, oh, this is so nice, and uh, pretty, like, lots of fun, not so complicated. And now you're, I remember, kind of, this is kind of where we would like to be, very good and just the right speed. And your scores have clearly shifted up towards this was very fast, and some of it was, for some of you, it was actually way too fast. Although you still kind of like the lecture, so that's good. Um, I also asked about the difficulty of the exercises. So this is for the very first exercise that you handed in last Monday. Um, and I think this is a, a decent distribution. It's always very difficult to ask you about how difficult the, ex the exercises are, because no one says, well, no one would say they're too easy. So I carefully ask, phrase the question so that I hopefully get a reasonably realistic answer from you. And I think this is a decent distribution. No one thought they were impossible to do. And no one said that they didn't do them, which is really good. Um, and yeah, so we've got some realistic distribution. The most important detailed feedback was that many of you found the Monday lecture too fast. There were two things we did at the same, pretty much right after each other, not at the same time, but right after each other. First, um, the theoretical foundations for how to work with functions of random events called random variables and how to construct probability distributions on continuous spaces. And uh, right after that, I went into an applied example, partly because I wanted to trade off a bit between doing fun examples and hard math, and partly because you needed it for the exercises. And that was probably too much, and it went too quickly. Well, I got through my Monday so I could give you my exercise sheet, but we should probably slow it down a bit. So what we'll do today is I've decided to, ma to make this lecture, which could have been two lectures, uh, sorry, which, which could have been one lecture, make it, make it into two lectures. So we'll do it today and then on next Thursday. By the way, there won't be an exercise sheet next week because next Monday is a public holiday and exercise sheets, sheets only go out on Mondays. So there's no exercise next week. Um, and I've split this lecture up into two. Of course, I can't quite keep myself from adding a bit of content if we do two lectures, but hopefully that helps slow things down. So let's take a step back and think of again very carefully in terms of the concepts <coughs> we did in the first half of the lecture on Monday about the stuff that we did in the second half of the lecture on Monday. So the question was, what's the probability that someone, eh, let's say in a general population, is wearing glasses? And first of all, for the setup, let's think about the concepts that we've used. So there are now random variables involved in this, in this inference problem. Two types of random variables. On the one hand, we have observations, people wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. <clears throat> and on the other hand, we have an unknown probability for these observations to have some binary value. This probability we call, let's call it y in this graph. And the observations, let's call them x1 to xn for the individual observations. Then all of these are called random variables because you can construct them as functions on some elementary um, event space. And here, you, you can already see an example of this, how we don't really need to talk about the elementary events. We just call everything a random variable because it's not even important to think about what the elementary events were. Um, and we have to think about the, the domains, the types of these individual variables. Those are binary, so they are either 0 or 1. And this is a real valued quantity that lies between 0 and 1, including for probability. And then the other thing maybe to point out, and I'll just do it for the last time here, and then after that I'll be much, much faster with it, but I know that people are often confused about this, so let's do it very slowly. There are different symbols attached to the name and the value of these random variables. So why is the random variable that describes the probability for someone to wear glasses, 
and pi is the value that that random variable takes. So that's like when you define a function, for example, in Python, you give the variable that goes into the function a name, and then when you call the function, you pass in a value to that named variable. So the name of that variable here is y, and the value we pass in is pi. Kind of obvious for computer scientists, but maybe it helps to start thinking about it this way, because then it becomes clear why there are two different symbols showing up, y and pi. And it's sort of customary to use capital letters for random variables and lowercase for the values they take, but that's a bit too much constraint on our namespace, so I'll later also use capital letters for something else, because otherwise we're going to run out of letters pretty quickly. And um, secondly, so in principle, if we were like proper probability theorists, we would need to write things like this, right? To say, there, what's the probability for the variable y to take the value pi? That's literally a function being evaluated with something plugged in. But that makes the, the, the formula very, very long, so I'll usually just write this. And correspondingly, this here is a function of two variables, probability of capital X i having the, taking the value little x i, given that the variable capital Y has the value pi. And I guess at this point, it already becomes clear why this is a bit tedious. Now, so now we've defined the problem. Now we need to define, so that these are sort of, this is sort of the syntax. Now we need the semantics. How are we going to do inference when we observe individual data? We use, thank you very much. Good. We use Bayes' theorem. Um, and so that means we start out with a prior probability distribution over the unknown quantity, pi. And I showed you this visualization. Here in this plot, on the left, you see the prior. I've decided to use a uniform prior again. And we already saw that we can vary this a little bit, but we'll get to that in a moment. So a uniform prior might be the most obvious thing to do in some sense, because if you really don't know, why prefer any of the individual values? And then to do inference, we multiply this prior with the likelihood and normalize by the evidence, we do Bayesian inference. So when we observe the first datum, the first person, who is in this case not wearing glasses actually, we need to multiply this prior by the likelihood and divide by the evidence. The evidence is the normalization constant, so we have to integrate out the terms on top. And then when we get the second observation, I'm going to multiply in a second likelihood. And there is an assumption hidden in, this, in doing this. This is not just totally automatic, but it amounts to the assumption, multiplying probability distributions, that the second observation is conditionally independent of the first one, given y, the probability to observe someone wearing glasses, or actually its value, pi. And what it actually means to be conditionally independent is this really, really tricky question. We already discussed it last Monday. So for example, here in this room, there is a certain group of people that probably isn't an ideal sample from the entire population because of your, your, your for example, all pretty much the same age. That's if we had a, a distribution that also included some older people, there would probably be more, more glasses around. We all, I also started counting at the front. So people in the front might be slightly more likely to wear glasses because they need to sit in the front to see better, something like this. Um, and such assumptions are going to be all over the place. But we'll just make them because it makes the computation easier. And it's not like everyone else isn't making them either. So let's actually plug in our observations. I've seen two people who are not wearing glasses. So now I've multiplied this prior twice with the likelihood. And for that, we had to ask this question, what actually is the likelihood? And I stood up here and asked you a few times, and we kind of convinced ourselves that the probability to see someone wearing glasses, if the probability to see someone wearing glasses, is just the probability to see someone wearing glasses, so it's just pi. It's the identity function. And if I now observe someone who is not wearing glasses, like in this case, then the probability to see someone who's not wearing glasses is just one minus the probability to see someone wearing glasses because there's only two possible options. You either are or you're not wearing glasses. Again, we could probably have some discussion about whether there's a third option or not, 
but probably we all agree that that's kind of a decent thing to do. So um, I've multiplied that in the term 1 minus pi twice. And we already observe, by the way, the third person is wearing glasses. How convenient. Um, we observe that this actually gives a quite interesting structured distribution. And that's actually the first time you see it. Maybe this is a little bit surprising because you'd sort of think these individual terms, they're just linear functions, right? They all look like this or like this. So if I just multiply in a bunch of those, that shouldn't be so complicated. But actually it is. Because as a function of this underlying unknown probability, pi, this is actually a power law in some sense. But it's a very, it's a sort of complicated higher order polynomial. So if you think of this bracket, if you open this up, like if you, like expand this bracket to get individual terms in pi and then multiply with those, you get a very high order polynomial, right? Well, high order, like of, of order number of observations we've made so far. And pretty much all the terms are in there. So, um, One part of the problem with this is that we need to normalize by the unknown function that integrates this, this term. We'll talk about that in a moment. The other one was how to, so, so let, or actually, no, so, huh? to normalize this, this, this object, we need to compute this integral. And then if we know what this thing is, we just give it a name, then we can describe this as a probability distribution, which is parameterized. Um, and what do I mean by parameterized? Let me tell you. So uh, after five observations, we have this kind of form. Ah, and then we stare at this, this expression for a while and try to convince ourselves what kind of prior we might, we might want to use to keep this computation tractable. And a simple option is to just use a uniform prior, just multiply by one. And then this question kind of goes away because it's just a term one. So the, the, the problem is gone. But we can actually be ever so slightly more general by allowing for priors that are of this form. So maybe, maybe I should stop talking here for a moment and ask you, what's the cool thing about this form? Can someone say a sentence about what, why this might be a good parametric form for a prior to choose? So, so you're saying A and B uh, uh, define the prior belief in, say again, the number of people. Already, so for example, let's say we already know, okay, uh, previous bias for five people wear glasses, if people not wear glasses, so A will be five people. That way we can easily integrate out. So maybe, maybe we can look at what this prior looks again. So if we, if we choose alpha less than, less than one, then this distribution can look like this like an asymmetric kind of trough-shaped thing that puts high probability on 0 and 1. <coughs> but we can make it, oh, yes? Yes, exactly. So this, this prior is of the same, I'll say, algebraic form as the likelihood. So the term up in the middle, that is to the left of the prior, is something of the form pi raised to some power, let's call it n, times 1 minus pi raised to some other power, let's call it m. And if you choose the prior of the same form, pi to the alpha times 1 minus pi to the beta, where you could also write alpha as a minus 1 and beta as b minus 1, then the posterior distribution will always involve only this term, only this pi to the alpha times one minus pi to the beta. And one nice thing about this is that, for example, if you wanted to have a generalization of this prior to alpha values larger than one, then we could just add in observations instead of setting alpha larger to one, just for this visualization. So this would be the prior with 3.7 on the right-hand side and 0.5 on the left. And we could pretend that that's a prior, 
and only start counting now. That's a sort of a, it's like a code we use, right? You could just use the, the prior that only takes in alphas between zero and one, and then generalize it to general observations. Another nice thing about this that's actually more important is that if we are able to solve this integral, then we will be able to keep tractable full Bayesian inference for any number of observations. And that's actually something that Laplace observed in his original text as well. So where is, I'm not gonna ask you again to translate, I've already done it. So in, in 1814, in his uh, treatise on the analytic theory of probabilities, he actually writes an observation like this. But it's 1814 and people spoke a bit quaintly back then, so you can read, when the values of x considered independent of the observed results are not equally possible, so the values of x are our probability pi, if they're not e equally possible, if we name z the function of x which expresses their probability, so the probability of, it's easy to see by what has been said in the first chapter of this book that by changing the formula to y times z, we will have the probability that the value x is within the limits of left and right end, and this amounts to assuming that all the values of x are equally possible a priori. So we can rescale the prior such that it becomes like a uniform distribution, and to consider the observed results as being formed by two independent results whose probabilities are y and z. We can thus reduce all the cases to the ones where we assume a priori before the event an equal possibility of the different values of x, and by this reason, blah, 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 blah. So he's sort of trying to explain that you can, you can actually start with a uniform prior, and then instead of having a different kind of prior, you start with a uniform prior and then you plug in some pseudo observations, like in this example. Now, Laplace had this problem that he uh, couldn't actually solve this integral, but um, I already mentioned on Monday that he found some solution around it using another integral that he could solve, which was close, the Gaussian integral, yes? So, you're already making the main point that this kind of situation where no matter how much data we have, the posterior only always keeps the same algebraic structure is called a conjugate prior. And here's the definition for it. Let's consider a data set and some unknown variable that we want to observe, uh, that we want to infer, sorry. So there's always going to be these two things the observed part, the data, and the latent thing, which we call x. And they are connected by this function called the likelihood, which is really central to Bayesian inference. It's not the prior that's so important. It's the likelihood that's the core part of the problem, which is a function of two quantities, the data and the unknown thing x. A conjugate prior for this likelihood, for this function, which has these two parameters going in, is a probability measure with probability density function, p of x, let's call it g of x and theta, so that's g is a function that takes in x and some other parameters, such that the posterior distribution that arises from applying Bayes' theorem, that's the thing in the middle, is, can be written as g of x and prior parameters plus some function of the data. So, by this notation, I mean in particular that this G is of the same algebraic form. So G could be implemented by some computer code, some program that takes in these parameters, and then we can compute the posterior by calling the same function over and over again and updating the parameter by taking the, taking the data, running some other function called phi on it, and feeding that function into the posterior. This function that we need to apply to the data is often called the sufficient statistics. And today we'll talk about the kind of distributions that give us this structure. 
And we'll first do a bunch of ex examples, and then we'll try and tease out the general structure, the general algebraic structure we're looking for. And then next Thursday, we'll talk a little bit more advanced about how we could use these kind of distributions and how to actually write them in code. So on Thursday next week, we'll stare at some Python code for quite some while. All right at the onset here, one thing I, we can already point out that, that for why this might be interesting to do. So, so there are two reasons, actually, why this is an interesting structure to have. The first one is that it's evidently computationally efficient. Right? If we know how, if we can f define the function g, then that function takes over, it automates the process of Bayesian inference. It basically says, in such situations, we can do Bayesian inference in closed form. Closed in the sense of in the abstraction of the function g, whatever g has to do inside. But it's, so there's some code that someone can hand to you, and it's just going to do Bayesian inference for you. Maybe it needs to do some fancy optimization inside, but that's what it's going to do. And the other, maybe slightly less obvious nice thing about this is that the data processing in such a situation in modern language happens outside of the inference. So notice how we have this function phi, the sufficient statistics, which we can call on the data set. And once we have called that, we hand its result to the function that does the inference. And that function is not going to touch the data again because it's encapsulated by phi. So this is actually, in 2023, the most interesting aspect of this, of this process. That if we have such an algebraic form, then we'll be able to encapsulate away the data processing and just compute these, that's why they're called sufficient statistics, and afterwards we can throw away the data set and never touch it again. Notice how this is quite different from what you do in deep learning, right? Where you have a data loader that keeps going back to the data and loads it and loads it. Yes? So, so your question is, can phi be a deep network? Of course, everything can always be a deep network because a deep network is just a function. But um, the, maybe the more important aspect is what it, what the, how we use the output of this function and what we feed in. So you're probably thinking of something that transforms the data, and then we hand the data to the inference. That's not what's, what's happening here. Instead, we're collapsing over the batch dimension of the data. So, in fact, what's happening, let's say you have a data set that actually we can do it here, right? So I have a data set here of, I don't know, 120 people. So the size of the data set is 120, all wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. But what I feed into my app is just two numbers. How many pluses, how many minuses, right? How many people with glasses, how many without glasses? And I can store this entire data set in two numbers. So that's a drastic reduction, not in the representation of the input of the data, but in the number of data points that I have to store. Right? So if you think of your textbook MDIST example, this is not about taking the images and transforming them onto some lower dimensional representation of the images, but it's taking the 60,000 images and reducing them to two. That's the, that's the cool thing that's happening here. So let's actually do this again for the case of beta inference. So here is, I'm really just going to uh, you know, rewrite what we already had in the language of the stuff that we just talked about. So the process, let me just do it, do it again really slowly, is we have a likelihood. Someone comes in with a likelihood that looks like this. Oh, and here on this slide, I actually made the mistake of forgetting the binomial coefficient, but it doesn't matter because it's going to be, ah, actually, it's a nice, maybe it's a nice teachable moment. So, Someone comes in with this probability for these observations. Um, all the x's are zeros or one. So we observe someone wearing glasses with probability f, or we observe someone not wearing glasses with probability one minus f. Now, I notice that I can rewrite this function by counting up how many zeros and ones I have. And oh, no, actually, it's actually correct. It's, it's actually correct, what I've written. And I can check with you why it's correct. So clearly, 
if I have n people wearing glasses and n, n one people wearing glasses and n zero people not wearing glasses, then I can just count how many f's I have in there, well, n one f's, and how many one minus f's I have in there, well, n zero, and um, then just write it like this. So I called this the binomial distribution at some point, but did I actually call this the binomial distribution or not? No. So this is a distribution over the axis. And on Monday, I said, when you do a change of variable to some other representation, some random variable that is derived, then you need to make sure that in your PDF, you're multiplying by the Jacobian, or actually, no, by the Jacobian for PDFs, and for discrete distributions like this, you have to count up the volume of the pre-image of this transformation. So if I want this to be a probability distribution over n1 and n0 rather than over x, then I need to multiply by this binomial coefficient. So by capital N, so n1 plus n, n, n0, over choose n1, or choose n0. That's the number of possible combinations n people um, could take if n one of them are wearing glasses. But since I wrote this as a distribution over x, it's fine, I can leave it here. So this is the typical situation. Someone comes in with a data set, there's no prior yet. Someone comes in with a data set and that's, that's the generative process of the data. There's some underlying unknown f and some known x. Please tell me how to do Bayesian inference. So now your job as the, the machine learning engineer kind of starts and you stare at this expression and you say, huh, okay, so this is a likelihood, so it's a distribution over x, and we can make it a distribution over n, and in n it's this exponential function, or in x as well, right? But in f, it's a power law. It's, it's f to raise to something times one minus f raised to, raised to something else. So my prior is probably going to be of that same form. It'll have to be a conjugate prior. So it'll also need to be of this form f raised to some power times one minus f raised to some other power. And then for historical reasons, we always end up with this minus one. It's just someone decided that that's more convenient to do. Who? Euler. <laughs> yeah, that's just how he wrote this integral. Because he wanted to interpolate the factorial function, and for some reason he found that more convenient. And um, so the only tricky thing left to do, if we, if, if we choose a prior like this, with this to, for this likelihood, then the posterior is going to have this form, right? We'll just get to add up the sufficient statistics of the data. So here the sufficient statistics are just how many people have I seen who wear glasses and don't wear glasses. And the only problem left, even for Laplace in 18 or something, is you need to normalize. You need to know how this integrates to one. And for that you need to divide by the integral over this thing. So in a way, this is still good because the only thing we need to be able to do is to solve integrals of this form. So if someone gave you a big book in 1805 that contains the integral and says you can write integrals of the form f to the alpha times one minus f to the beta as this number, then we can automate this process. We can just plug in our numbers for n1 and n2 or n0 and look up in the table what's the value of this integral, plug it in. Now, in 1805, Laplace didn't have this. He only had Gauss's integral, so that's why he used Gauss's approximation, or actually his approximation, now called the Laplace approximation. But it's 2023, and we have these things. They're called beta functions, and they're in SciPy. And they're super, super precise. They're down to machine precision precision. So just, you just call them. Great. Now that's actually what I've done in this code. And here's the definition of this function again, right? So you can write it in this form. This is related to this gamma function, which is also in Euler's treatment. And Euler was really interested in this function because if z is an integer, then gamma is an interpolation of the factorial function, which was back then defined in this way. And the beta function can be constructed through the gamma function. And if the uh, parameters are integers, then we can think of them as computing essentially binomial coefficients for us. And in fact, 
in some of your homework next, well, the week after next week, you'll get to use a bunch of binomial functions, and then you'll find out that often that this is it's a convenient name, this B, because it's also the binomial function in a sense. So now, to make sure we understand, let me ask you one question. Let's say I have such a distribution. I have this, this, this is, by the way, called the beta distribution because it uses the beta integral. It's one of these, there's a whole family of all these functions, uh, dist probability distributions, which have names of Greek characters, not because the Greek character matters in any particular way, it's just because the normalization constant happens to be the first or the second or the third integral that shows up in a treatment by Euler from 18 or something, or 17 or something. Let's say I have such a distribution. So for example, I could say, I've now, I, I do the first row, right? So I have 0, 0, 1, one success, two failures, and I've chosen my uniform prior, to make it a bit easier. Now someone tells me, actually in this room, there's 120 people. Please predict how many people are gonna wear glasses without looking at the further rows. So of course I can look at everyone, but maybe if I just want to predict the future from the data I've seen so far, what do I do? You say we can either do the expectation of the posterior or we can do the argmax. So, based on the size of the posterior, they should assume. Ah, so, okay. So I wanted to say, why not the posterior? Um, but, so your, your, this is maybe good to, to, to stop briefly. Um, so, this is the posterior over the random variable y, which has, takes values pi, so the probability for someone to wear glasses. What I would like to have is a associated probability distribution over the number of people in this room wearing glasses. That's a different random variable. And in particular, it's integer value. And its values do not lie between zero and one, its values lie between let's say zero and 120. Let's pretend that I know that there's 120 people in this room. So for this, I've actually made a slide. Let's hope that it contains the right things. So um, let's say I, ah, so this is bad, not, <laughs> this is inconvenient that I've chosen use, use X and Y here in the same, so let's think, look at this expression up here again. Right? Let's, pre let's say I know capital N, and I would like to predict N1 as a function of capital N, or I equivalently, I could predict the individual axis. Yes? Don't you want to just predict the So the first sentence is, this is what we are trying to do, is predictive, predictive inference. It's just prediction. That's what machine learning is supposed to do all the time, right? You get some data, you finish the training. Our training was this process we just looked at on, this, on, on, on the app. And now you need to predict something else, the future. So you're exactly right. What, I'm, what I need to do is I need to write down the generative distribution of the unknown quantity in this case, let's call it x. Let's, for example, say I wanted to predict the next person wearing glasses or not wearing glasses, um, and multiply it with the like, un under, given the, the unknown quantity, and multiply it with my current belief over the unknown quantity. So why is that the right thing to do? First of all, this is the sum rule. I could also have written this as the probability of the unknown thing the thing to be predicted, and the other thing that helps us predict it, and just integrate out the thing I don't know, f. It's a case of I have two variables, but I only care about one of them, so what do I do? I sum out the one that I don't know. And so now here is a case where the notation, again, is, I'm, I'm constantly going to do this across, across the term, is complicated. So if you have some distribution over f, whatever that distribution is, you can predict other quantities x in this way. 
In particular, this P of F could be a posterior arising from some other data. It could be the posterior arising from these three data points in the front row. And I could use it to predict the next datum, datum number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or maybe all 120. So what do I need to do that, what, what to do to, to, to make this prediction? Well, I plug in the likelihood for this next observation. Uh, and here is, I made this last night, so I swapped between X and N, stupid. So I could have called this P of N or N1 given F and N or P of the next observation um, in, in this form. This would be if I wanted to predict all the next observations, all the a capital N observations. They are going to be of this form as well, right? Because they also depend on F in the very same way. And my belief about F this distribution, whether it's a prior or a posterior, will be of this algebraic form. So therefore, this integral that I need to solve, what is it? Uh, is it x and n1 or x and n1? Yeah, so I'm sorry about this x and n business. So there's two situations that are mixed up in this slide. Either I want to predict the next datum, one individual person, that's a binary variable, zero or one, or I want to predict the number of people wearing glasses in this room. And these are two different quantities. If I just want to predict the next person, x, then this x is a binary random variable. If I want to predict the next uh, n people, cap uh, capital N people, or n without index people, then I need to write down a binomial distribution and multiply by a binomial coefficient here. But that binomial coefficient doesn't actually matter. I can just like, plug it in there or not. Right? It doesn't depend. Like, it matters for the numbers that come out, but it doesn't involve, like, it's outside of this integral because it's outside of the integration. Like, it, it's not dependent on f. So, again, like, I also have technical questions from this point. So, the binomial coefficient also exists for the, the, uh, for the above function, which is that you're considering a single variable. That's why it's kind of like a binomial variable. Yeah, so I have to clean up this slide and say, what if I wanted to predict n new observations? out of which n1 are going to be positive and n0 are going to be negative, then this distribution here is a binomial co uh, distribution which has a binomial coefficient in front that is n over n1. But n and n1, do not like, they are not f, so they can go outside of this integral. right? And this slide is about this integral, so that's why I forgot about it annoyingly. You had a question? Uh -huh. Yes, exactly right. So what we observe is to predict more data, we get an integral that is of the form of the normalization constant from our posterior inference before. And so we can solve it. It it's, it's con contains this number that we need to know to be, do, to be able to do Bayesian inference in the first place. And then we just take a, 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 a fraction, a relation between them. A, like we just divide one by the other. So actually, I have an app for this as well. So if you want to pull from this Git, let me just do that. If, 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 if you want to pull from this Git repo again, there's a new, last night I pushed a new folder, four, which contains another app, which I have here. And here is another way of looking at this problem. So let's say there is some process that produces binary observations. They are either 0 or 1. And I get to choose how many of them I'm going to see. Let's say 10 observations. And those 10 observations happen with some unknown probability, f. And in this case, I've rewritten it such that I actually provide this unknown f. It's sort of like outside of the, there's someone secretly in the last row here setting the probability to some value. And I'm not setting the individual observations directly, but I'm creating a situation where I can create such observations. So what I've done here is 
I've drawn from this actual binomial distribution 10 observations. So here in red, this, this bar chart, that, those are the 10 observations. We have eight failures and two successes. The probability is 50-50, but if you draw 10 random numbers from the 50-50 probability, this is actually quite likely to happen. It's a bit of an annoying, it's almost a bit of an outlier, but it just happens with your 10 observations. And now what I do is I write down this likelihood, the likelihood for this observation. So this likelihood is a function of two quantities. We could think of it as a function of f and fix the data, then you get this blue curve. That's the likelihood. So this is really this function f to the 2 times 1 minus f to the 8. That's just what this looks like. And you can see that this is not a probability distribution. It's not a probability density function, because if you integrate this with your i integral, this doesn't add up to 1, right? It's a domain is 0 to 1, and we add up numbers that are, you know, less than 1. So if you add up numbers less than 1 over a domain of width 1, you'll get out something less than 1. So we need to normalize, and you divide by the beta um, integral over those observations, and that gives us a posterior. So this red posterior, would be our belief over what f is. If we didn't know that the true f is actually 50%, no one had told us this, and we just had those observations. This black line here, that's the actual value of uh, p, or f true, right? Of the actual, actual probability to draw these numbers. And you can see that it's, it's in a region where the posterior has low probability. But it doesn't have zero probability. It's still possible that that's the right answer. And what I could now do is sort of reverse the situation and say, if this were your belief over P, this red distribution, what would be your predictive distribution for 10 observations? If I tell you I'm not going to draw 10 observations, what's the distribution going to look like? And then you get these golden bars. So it's possible to get this observation or this observation or this observation, and you can see that it's actually, it makes these, the red observations quite likely, but it also has a non-trivial probability on the, um, the correct value. And if I now increase the number of observations, then we'll get more and more observations, and of course they'll contract around the 50% because law of large numbers, and the, both the posterior and the corresponding predictive distribution are going to concentrate around the true value. Yes? No. So, well, um, no. So we do not condition on how likely it is to observe six positive or negative. So what I've done here is, and I realize that this is a bit dangerous to do, is to say, first of all, I give you some data. Now use this data to learn something about the distribution. And then predict the data itself. Right? But not the actual numbers of the data, but predict something like this data set. Right? So predict. So let's be a bit, a bit more precise. I said, I have queried a number of observations, in this case, 45, and I have had this many positive and negatives. Now, if I gave you another data set of 45 observations, under the posterior that you have after those 45 observations, what would be your predictive distribution for the outcome of this experiment? And that's this golden distribution. So it sounds a bit circular, but it actually isn't. It's just that I didn't want to have another set of sliders here with more plots in the plot to make it even more complicated. So otherwise, I could have had two different ends, right? I, of course, I can predict two different experiments with different ends. Is this 10 over 10 now, or no? Here it's 45, but. So this is for the next 45, right? That's why you get ever more bars, right? So actually, if I go back to, if I, it, I mean, this code works for zero, and it just doesn't predict anything, because I can always predict the data set of size zero. And if I have a data set of size 1, then I can only predict the data set. Well, this code can only predict the data set of size 1. 
Of course, I can take this posterior and use it to predict a data set of size 100. Yes. Just, just for this plot. That's why I have two different apps, right? You can use the one from the third lecture to do the other situation. Okay, so by the way, last week, after the lecture, I noticed that I had an email from Streamlit saying, your app ran out of resources. Everyone clicked on the link, used it, and then it died because it didn't have enough resources. Unfortunately, there isn't even a way to pay for the Streamlit cloud. It's just a community service, so I can't really do much about this. If you, if you want to have the app running on your own machine, just do this stuff down here, and then you can just run it, and it's going to work assuming you have Python. So, and actually, so one nice side effect of this is it, it forces me to write this requirements list because it has to work on the cloud server. So I'm pretty sure that after this, it should work for you. It it's like automatically making sure you have to write packages. So this is the situation. Let me see where we are time-wise. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, okay, let me speed up a little bit, but without going too crazy, because we've now really gone really slow to make it very clear. I hope this helps. But if it gets too slow at some point, you know, let me know in the feedback. So now, let's think of a slightly different situation. Let's say I don't ask whether people are wearing glasses, but I ask a question that has multiple possible answers. Like, for example, I could ask, I'm not going to ask, but I could ask for your nationality or so, something that also is a binary value of which everyone typically only has one. Well, actually, nationalities don't work this way in Germany, but whatever. Something else that has more than two possible answers. Then I would need a distribution over what's called the multivariate probability distribution, or the multinomial, or sometimes called the cate. So there's the binomial, which relates to the Bernoulli probability the same way that the multinomial distribution relates to the categorical probability distribution. So the categorical distribution is I have one event that takes one out of k possible values, and the multinomial distribution is I have n events of which each can take values from 1 to k. That's a pretty straightforward generalization of this binary situation. And you're going to do it in your exercise sheet. Well, you're already doing it in your exercise sheet, so I'm not going to tell you too much about it, but I'm going to solve sort of the first part of the exercise for you. This notion is connected to this young man from Richelieu, which is in modern-day Belgium, and back then was in some weird late or early modern microstate. Um, he came from a, from a family around there, and they all come from, from this little town, Richelieu. And his father wanted to distinguish himself from his father, so he called himself the young guy from Richelieu, the Jeune de Richelieu. Uh, and you can sort of hear the Belgian accent coming, coming through. So he named himself after his father, so he's called Père Gustave, Le Jeune de Richelieu. And that's his distribution, so it's called the de Richelieu distribution. So there's something about these distributions that they are always named after some random historical fact. They are called after which, whether the integral that Euler solved is the first or the second one, the beta or the gamma distribution. And the one that actually has a proper name is named after a guy who named himself after his father, who named himself after the place that he came from, and he's the young guy from there. So, weird. Nevertheless, this is the idea behind it. And now, let's see if you can do it quickly, but get the patterns right. So someone comes in with a likelihood that says, I have observed a bunch of numbers that are categorically distributed, and they are independent of each other, drawn with some unknown probability distribution that is, of course, parameterized by k numbers, if you have k categories. Actually, it's, one, it's k minus 1, because the last one has to make sure they sum to 1. But you know. So let's say something like k parameters. And I would like to learn that function, that probability distribution. I would like to know with which probability each of these classes shows up. You can imagine that that's a very common situation all across inference. So now what we do is we stare at this expression. We notice that we could also parameterize it in terms of how many observations we've made, not what the individual observations were, but how many of them we had. 
If we wanted to make this a distribution over n rather than x, we would have to multiply with some multivariate generalization of binomial coefficients. You get those from the beta integral. But we don't have to, because it doesn't matter for posterior inference. It's just going to be a constant that will show up both in the numerator and the denominator, so it's going to cancel out anyway. So for Bayesian inference, this doesn't matter. We can write this thing like this. This is not a probability distribution over x, but Sorry, it's a probability distribution over x, but not over n, but it doesn't matter. We care about its relationship to f. We want to do Bayesian inference on f. So therefore, our prior will have to be of the same algebraic form. It'll also have a term like this in there. And terms like this need to be normalized. So now we need to this know to know this normalization constant again. But actually, it turns out there's a straightforward generalization of the beta case to the multinomial case. And it's this multivariate beta function which looks like this, and you see that it again uses the gamma function. So if you can call gamma functions, you can compute these things. If we do this, then here's the point where you quickly have to pay attention. Clearly, if I do Bayesian inference and I multiply this likelihood with this prior, I get out a posterior that is something f to the raised, raised to some power, right? where each element of this vector f is raised to some power. And what I need to do is I just need to add up how many observations I've made. So the sufficient statistics are, let's just count how many observations I've made. So if you give me the entire data set, I go through it, I just count up how many of the classes I've seen, I can do this in one pass through the data set, and then I never have to touch the data again, I can do Bayesian inference afterwards. This is what this looks like as a little app. So um, it's the same situation, it's just more complicated to plot. So now we have three classes, because I can't plot more than four, because then I can't plot this distribution over here. It's hard enough to draw it in three. We have three classes. They come from an original distribution that I set down here. In this case, I've set the first class to 30% probability. That's this. The second class to 0.23% probability. And that, of course, defines the third class, because they have to sum to one. That's the golden bar here. But I could set it further down to, ah oh yeah, here we go. There was a, this, this thing had, oh, had not updated yet. OK, so this is uh, one draw, zero draw. So before I see anything, I have a prior. The prior is over here. You don't see anything in this plot. Why? Because it's flat. I've set all the parameters to one. So it's a uniform distribution over this thing, which is called the simplex, by the way. It's a uh, uh, polygon that constrains the space of all possible numbers that sum to one. I could also change the prior a bit, and then you'll see some structure in this Dirichlet prior. So the Dirichlet prior has these parameters, alpha, for each of these terms, and we can use them, use them to make pretty steep, crazy distributions, or also slightly peaky distributions that are centered somewhere. If all the parameters are larger than one, you get some kind of centered thing. I won't talk too much about this because you're doing it in your exercise and you can play with this distribution yourself if you want to. So I'll go back to the uniform prior so that you believe me that it's not, not about the prior. I set the true probability to, uh, yeah, let's actually make it pretty peaky. So it's somewhere decently outside of the center of the simplex. And now we get the first uh, eh, observations. One observation, it's the second class. Two observations, it's the second and the third class. Three observations, it's the second and the third class twice, and so on and so on and so on. And if I now make several observations, like say 17 observations, the posterior will concentrate around the true value, which is this point. And I can use this posterior to make a prediction about what a data set of the size 17 might look like, and those are these golden bars. How do I make that prediction? Here's our sanity check to see, oops. Um, actually, no, I'm not gonna ask you here because it, that's in your exercise. So, but we can do it for another case. So here's another situation which is connected to this wonderful chap, Daniel Bernoulli, clearly a Baroque uh, person from a, the age when people didn't have hair so they, have to, so they had to wear fake hair because it died because of all of the lice that they have that they had. Um, let's say you make observations that are continuous valued. They're not counts. 
but they come from a Gaussian probability distribution, so they are normal distributed. And they're, they, you even know what the mean of this Gaussian distribution is. It has, without loss of generality, mean zero. But what you don't know is your measurement error. You don't know what the variance, the standard deviation, the spread of your Gaussian distribution is. So you observe x's that are drawn from independently from a Gaussian distribution which has a mean and a variance. And Gaussian distributions look like this. I'm not going to introduce the one-dimensional Gaussian distribution because that will be insulting to you. So it looks like this. And let's say we know what mu is, but we don't know what sigma is. What do we do? And maybe by now you've seen the recipe and we can follow the recipe. Yes. Yeah, so we did, I, I said we don't care about mu at the moment. We just, we just care about sigma, actually. So what we can do is we can stare at this expression and see what kind of algebraic form it has in sigma. So where the, oh, there's a bug. This should be a sigma squared, not a sigma two, of course. There's a hat missing here. So sigma shows up in two points in this equation, down here in the normalization constant and over there in the exponential. So we could also write down the, maybe it's easier to see if we write down the log of this distribution, then we see that the logarithm of this distribution is a function in which sigma shows up in two places, here, because now it's also correct without the stupid typo, and here. And then there is a bunch of numbers here floating around as well. So to follow the very same process, we now just say, okay, let's think of a prior that has the same algebraic form. And now the tricky part is it has to have the same algebraic form in sigma, not in x and y, uh, sorry, not in x and mu, but in sigma, because that's the thing we, do, we don't know. So we'll need a function whose logarithm looks like this as a function of sigma. And it looks like this. So we, we, we assume that our prior, conjugate prior distribution for sigma will look like some, some, something, something, something times the logarithm of sigma inverse squared. Why is there an inverse? Well, because there's effectively an inverse up here as well. This minus is like something I could draw in here, right? And it's also, I mean, you can see it, there's an inverse here, sigma squared. Minus some other constant times one over sigma squared minus some normalization constant. So the only thing we need to know is the normalization constant, z, of alpha and beta, so we need to be able to integrate over expressions of this form. So here they are, sorry, we have to integrate over the exponential of expressions of this form, right, because that's the probability distribution. So it turns out that you can do that, and it gives an answer that looks like this, so that's the, the inverse of the normalization constant, and so there's a beta to the alpha, that's just a transformation of variable thing, but the tricky part is this stupid integral that we had a few times already, the third Eulerian integral, the gamma function. And that's because Euler wrote this in the third, third position in his, in his essay on the, I don't know, page four or so. This is why this distribution is called the gamma distribution. And it's connected actually with the work of Daniel Bernoulli. So if we decide to parameterize our prior in this form, then the posterior will be of this algebraic form as well. And to update it, we need to take the terms that look like the one over sigma square bit and add them up. So what's the terms there? It's n half, right? So we need to update alpha with n half. Essentially, we need to count how many things we've seen. And we need to update beta with this sufficient statistics. It's the sum of the square distances from the mean. Ah, sounds interesting. So, Notice how this is something you can compute as you go through the data in O of n once, and then you never have to touch the data again. You can do everything afterwards just with this. Um, I have an app for this as well. So let me make sure that it actually is properly initialized. So here is no data. If I get one datum, in red, I show you, in this case, the correct distribution because it's a bit complicated, right? It's a, it's a 
it's a Gaussian distribution with an unknown variance. Here I've set the variance to one, but I can make it larger or smaller. Um, let's set it to one so that it's easy. And on the right, I plot the likelihood. The likelihood is just the Gaussian function plotted as a function of sigma rather than of x and mu. So it doesn't look like a Gaussian, but that's a Gaussian. It's just a different way of looking at a Gaussian distribution. I could multiply this thing with its conjugate prior. This conjugate prior is this gamma distribution. It also has parameters, alpha and beta, which I've here set to one. You get to play with them if you want to. Install the app for yourself and shift those sliders around. And then I get a posterior distribution that looks like this red curve over here. After a single datum, that was a lucky datum that got it just right at the true distribution. Um, if I actually increase the number of data points, it's probably going to be a little bit off. Yeah, so now the posterior moves around a bit, but it'll quickly concentrate on the true value. So the red curve concentrates on the true value. In this plot, the, the golden thing is the prior distribution, which doesn't change. And on the right-hand side, you see the predictive distribution in gold or mustard colored. So this is if we ask for what's the probability for one more Gaussian sample, what's its distribution going to, like, where is it going to fall? And this distribution is not a Gaussian distribution. You can maybe see that it has heavier tails, especially if I go to a smaller number here. So it, it sort of, it decays more slowly. Why? Well, let's think about how you would compute this, this thing. You take, and this is connected to the story of, actually, maybe this helps to tell the story here. I've mentioned it before in la la last year, if you were in, in the other lecture, that this guy, he's called William Seeley Gossett. He, was, he studied in the UK, and then he lived in, in Ireland, and in London worked for the Guinness Brewery to make beer, important job in the beginning 20th century. He was, at some point, the master brewer of the Guinness Brewery. And if you make beer, that's like a continuous experimental design problem. You set up these barrels, and then they sit, and sometimes the beer is good, sometimes it's bad. Of course, these days, it's very narrow, con precisely controlled. But in 1900, it wasn't. It was a very nasty kind of process. And so he needed to figure out what the variances of his, his experiments were. But he had studied under Pearson in statistics. He knew all about all of this beautiful math. And so he did the following derivation that we are going to do now. It's the same thing as for the beta and the gamma. It's really the same thing. We, we have a, a likelihood that in this case someone has given to us, which looks like this. We've convinced ourselves that that's the conjugate prior for it. So if we have constructed a conjugate posterior of this form, that's just a function that gets evaluated at sigma and has parameters alpha and beta. Those parameters might come from some previous experiments, or they might just be set in some way. Somehow we have those parameters alpha and beta. If I now want to predict the next observation, where it's going to fall, then I need to marginalize out this unknown parameter of sigma in this um, generative process. And if that... If, if this likelihood is of this Gaussian form, so I plug it in here, and this prior is of this gamma form, which I plug in here, then this looks really confusing. And if the first time you see this equation, you go, whoo, where am I supposed to look? Well, think of this thing as a function of sigma. So sigma shows up here and there and there and there. So there are two terms that look like sigma raised to some, um, sigma inverse raised to some power. And there's two terms that involve an exponential of minus sigma to the minus 2. And we just rearrange those terms, take all the stuff that doesn't depend on sigma outside, add up all the exponents. So it's just like updating the, the posterior with one more datum. And then marginalize out to get a normalization constant, which is given by the normalization constant of the gamma distribution. It's just raised to other parameter values. So it looks like this. And then you can convince yourself that you can also write it like this, which is a form that some of you who have taken a stats, cl stats class have seen before. This is called, well, this guy, Gosset. It should, it should actually be called the Gosset distribution. But because somehow these distributions always end up with stupid names, he was working for a company. So he was under an NDA. He wasn't allowed to publish. He couldn't write under his name. But they allowed him to publish under a pseudonym. So he called himself student. And this thing is called the student t distribution. Because in his paper, he called it the t distribution. <laughs> 
That's what happens if you work in industry, can't publish, so you have to be under, under, a, under a pseudonym. So that's, the, that's this golden distribution. And it's a more heavy tail thing because you can see that it's not a Gaussian. It's not an exponential of something something. It's a rational function. It's one over a quadratic term in, the, in x raised to a power. That's why it's sometimes called the rational quadratic, one over um, square power. Just one more, and then we're done. What about if you had a normal distribution, and you know what the variance is, typical situation in science, you look up on your, in your instrument, it says measurement error 0.1, but you don't know the mean. If you want to measure something, you get, you get to measure it many times, and you don't know what the average is. Imagine it's 17 or something, you're living in Brunswick, and you, your, your local landlord has asked you to figure out the size of his country. That's his job. That's what he did. That's why he, what, what he actually got paid for. So you triangulate the entire country, you build all these towers, traveling around with an entourage of servants, with precise measurements across the country to figure out what the size of, what was that? The view of Hanover or something is? Um, and you keep making measurements, and you know pretty much what the error of your measurements are, but you want to know the values of the underlying things. So translating this into math is what he did, is to say we get observations that are all drawn from a normal distribution centered on the same location, but I don't know what that location is. So that's a Gaussian distribution whose mean I don't know. What's the conjugate prior for this distribution? And some of you will know, but let's follow the recipe. So we take the logarithm of this distribution, as in the previous slide. So there is a bunch of terms that all look the same. Here is my typo again, um, that come up here and there. They don't depend on x, so they are essentially constants now. In the previous slide, they were important because we were trying to infer sigma. Now we want to infer x. And then there is this quadratic term in here. So how, but there's a quadratic term and there's y's in there. How do I, how do I come up with an algebraic form that keeps this like as a function of x? I need to expand the brackets. So I really go in and say, this is a quadratic term, so it's yi squared plus yix minus x squared. And now I see, ah, OK, the conjugate prior of this thing is going to be an exponential of a quadratic function. Ooh, OK, that gives me a hint. It's probably going to be something Gaussian, right? Because the Gaussian is an exponential of a square. But what, what are its parameters, actually? if I want to be able to sum up. So what are the sufficient statistics of the data? Hmm. What do I need to compute of y to be able to hand it on? I need to compute yeah, the average. So I need just two sums that involve y here, right? And actually, there's three sums. It's just you can sort of think of this as a polynomial in y. It's raised to the second power, to the first power, and to the zeroth power. So what I need to know is how many data I have. That's the sum over ones. What their average value is, that's their sum up to normalization. And then I need to divide by the number of observations, but thankfully I've just stored that. And I need to sum the squares. So there are three sufficient statistics. The number of observations, the average value of the observations, and the average square of the observation. So my prior that will be conjugate to this will have to have the same algebraic form. It'll have to be something something with this parameter v squared plugging in for sigma squared times a square of x, like the term over here, with a minus in front, then something linear in x, and something constant to update those sufficient statistics. It's just that. The coefficients of this polynomial annoyingly have to have a complicated form so that I can write it in the form that we tend to think of when we do Gaussians. So this is a quadratic, and you can think of this as a Gaussian with mean m and variance v squared. 
but it doesn't look like it yet. But if we write it like this, then we can do conjugate Bayesian inference. We can multiply the likelihood with the prior. That is like adding those two terms because they're the logarithms of each other. And that just means I need to add the squares. I need to add the, the, the linear terms and I need to add the constant terms. What does that do to my parameters in M? Well, this is sort of a, a finger exercise that you could do in a homework, but I'm not going to ask you to do it in a homework. It's called completing the square in English or quadratische Ergänzung in German. So I need to sit and stare at it for a bit to figure out how to set the parameters. And you'll end up finding out that the, the updated sort of Gaussian representation is looks like this. So the, the posterior on x, after observing a bunch of y's, is you compute the sum over the squares. Sorry, you compute the sum over the, over, over, over the observations. You compute the number of observations you've, you've seen. And then you do a bunch of algebra. So you add up the inverse of the variance uh, time plus n times the observation noise. And if you find this confusing, it doesn't matter because we're going to have three lectures on this kind of algebra in a proper form in a bit. But the main point here to take away is if you have Gaussian distributions, then they, are, they actually allow conjugate prior inference in the same way that we could do this for categorical, binary, or rate valued distributions. So psi is defined over here. It's this term that shows up here, because if I plugged it in there, it would be too long for the slide. OK, so there are these objects. Actually, I have an app for this as well, but I'll just let you play with it. It looks the same way, and you can sort of do the same thing. There are these distributions which allow closed form Bayesian inference in these admittedly very boring situations. This isn't AI yet. It's just inferring a bunch of variables. Quickly, it'll become AI. Um, and they're neat because they reduce the problem of full Bayesian inference, producing an entire posterior, not just a point estimate, the entire posterior, into writing one function called the sufficient statistics, which is a pre-processing of the data. And then after that, we never have to touch the data again. And secondly, into writing down a function that does the closed form conjugate prior inference. And what it, all it needs to do is to just add up the sufficient statistics to some prior parameters, and then renormalize by evaluating this unknown normalization constant, or this well, hopefully known normalization constant, the tricky one. So basically, this fu these functions reduce to figuring out what the normalization constant is. And if you have a book available of someone who tells you what the gamma is, or the expert, or the the beta integral, or whatever else interesting function, or if, it, if it's available to you in SciPy, then you're done. And now, in the remainder of the remaining few minutes, before I let you, I let you off the hook, um, let's think about the structure we need for this to work. This is basically a translation of these individual observations we just made, these individual recipes we followed, into a clean algebraic statement. And this is connected to the form, to the notion of what's called an exponential family. Remember that what we did is someone gives you the likelihood, you think of, um, you, we take the logarithm, and then we look at what the, what, what the, what, which expression the logarithm has as a function of the data. If you look at the logarithm, that means that the true distribution is going to be an exponential. So exponential families are probability distributions over a variable. Here the variable is called x, which are parameterized by a bunch of parameters that we call w in this slide. And they have this algebraic form, which is carefully designed to be the most general thing. We actually not quite. In a moment with the last sentence here, it's going to be the most general thing we can write without breaking this conjugacy situation. So, what are they like? They contain a bunch of terms in x outside in the front, which just depend on x and are not parameterized by the parameters further. h of x. This was, for example, in a moment we'll see the binomial coefficient was a little bit like this. 
This is called the base measure sometimes. And then here's the business end. There's an exponential of a linear term in the parameters and a nonlinear function in X called the sufficient statistics. And those parameters are then called the natural parameters of this exponential family. And then there's the important bit, the normalization constant, also called the partition function. And with the logarithm in front, we sometimes call it the log partition function. And for historical reasons, sometimes there isn't actually a W in here, but some other parameters which we can think of as providing the natural parameters, which are then called the canonical parameters. So here's an example, which you already had, the binomial distribution. This is the way we encountered it. Now I have called it Q rather than F, just to confuse you even more. Um, and if, if you stare at this expression, you can convince yourself that you can, you, you can rewrite it in this way. Even though it doesn't look like there's an exponential function in there, actually there is, right, in K. So this is a distribution over K parameterized by some parameter Q. And we can write it in this form. So this doesn't quite look like the expression we were looking for, but it has something that looks like a base measure and then an exponential which, which involves functions of K. So if you assume that we know how many observations we make, then we can write it in this form. And we now it really looks much more like this exponential family form. It has a base measure, something that doesn't depend on the parameter. There's no Q in here. And then the exponential of a function of the data. So here the sufficient statistics are just the actual number of observations. And then a parameter, which in the normal notation happens to be the logarithm of Q over one minus Q, but we can also just call it W. And then a normalization constant, which depends on Q, so therefore also on W, and not on the data. There is no K in here. So that's why it's an exponential family. Here's the beta distribution. So that's a distribution over Q, parameterized by alpha and beta. And we encountered it like this. We can rewrite it like this. So there is a one in front. So the base measure is trivial. It's just one. Convenient because Q is on the simplex, but on zero, one. So we don't really need a base measure. Um, and then there's a f stuff that depends on the parameter. Uh, on, on, sorry, that depends on the variable Q in particular log Q and log one minus Q, and then parameters, which we could call W1 and W2, and they are identified with this alpha minus one, beta minus one historically. And then there's a normalization constant which doesn't depend on Q, but only on alpha and beta or on W. By the way, it's quite often the case that you can parameterize these families in different ways. For example, you could also write the same distribution this way. It's just a question of how you de decide to drag out um, the dependence on the variable away from the parameters. So another way to parameterize is to say alpha and beta actually are the, the, the natural parameters, but there is a uh, base measure out front. It's this business of long philosophical discussion about whether uh, the, a uniform prior is a natural prior or whether a spiky prior that has only masses at zero and one is the correct prior. Jeffrey's priors and so on, if you've ever heard about this. And then finally, and most importantly, the Gaussian distribution is also an exponential family. So um, here is the form that we usually encounter in the textbooks. And you can rewrite it by dragging out a base measure that's called one over square root of two pi, and then observing that there is a structure in here of terms that depend on x, on the variable, and a bunch of terms that don't depend on x, and those are the partition function. And annoyingly, those, the, the natural parameters of the Gaussian distribution, they look a bit weird compared to the ones that we are, that we are used to encountering. The first natural parameter, actually, let's take the second one first. The second one is one over the variance. This is sometimes called the precision or the negative precision. 
And then the other natural parameter is the mean divided by the variance. That's sometimes called the precision adjusted mean. So the sufficient statistics are a function of x. So we can use them to estimate mu and sigma to do inference. But the sufficient statistics here are, here they are, they are x and 1 half x squared. So they are actually polynomial terms or moments of the data. The sufficient statistics of the Gaussian are the non-central the yeah, the non-central moments of the data. And the normalization constant is this. So we, will, we are going to come back to this over the next, I don't know, 10 lectures because the main business with Gaussians, which will turn out to be a wonderful, powerful tool, is sort of encapsulated in this situation, which is that the parameters we usually care about, the spread, the variance, sigma squared, and the center, the mean, mu, they're sort of hidden in the natural parameters. And if you, want to, if you want to know these things that we usually care about, like where is the center of the distribution and how broad it is, we need to do some computations on them, which in the scalar case are straightforward. They're just annoying algebra. In the multivariate case, they become computationally taxing. So it turns out that there is even more of these distributions. And if you were here in 19. 54, and this were a stats lecture, this would have been maybe the last lecture in a way. We would have, this had been the end of term. We would have carefully gone through all of these dis different special settings of how to do inference, and these engender all these corresponding wonderful concepts in statistics with p-values and un un unbiased estimators and all these things that you've seen in your stats lecture if you've taken one. For example, those of you who study cognitive science at some point have probably taken a stats class. You've learned about all of these tests and things, and they're all connected to these exponential families. There is the Bernoulli distribution, which we already, uh, well, which is the trivial one. It's just a distribution for a coin toss. There is the Poisson distribution, which is a special case of the gamma distribution. It's a heavy-tailed distribution over positive value things that arrive with a certain rate. For example, if you want to have a model of how many emails you get every day, there's the Laplace distribution, which is a heavy-tailed thing. It's used for extreme events, like floods that happen every, every now and then. There is the chi-square distribution, which was actually maybe invented by a German guy called Helmert. And chi-square is yet another one of these stupid Greek names that don't mean anything. It's the distribution over the square. Uh, sorry, the sum of squares of normal distributed random variables. So you use them to estimate variances as well in specific settings. There's the Dirichlet distribution, which we encountered for categorical variables. There's the Euler distribution, um, which is essentially, well, no, it's actually the gamma distribution. Um, it's just named after an integral that Euler solved, so maybe it should be called the Euler distribution. There is a generalization of the gamma distribution to multivariate quantities called the Vichard distribution, which can be used to estimate covariances, and it's used in economics to study covariances between different derivatives. There is the Gaussian distribution, which is very important, and it has the sufficient statistics given by the first two non-central moments of the data, actually the first three, including the zeroth one. And there are even more, more crazy generalizations. So the Boltzmann distribution is in some sense a very general distribution that also makes it very difficult to work with it. Why are these so important? That's going to be the final thing that I tell you before we head out. First of all, Every single exponential family distribution has a conjugate prior. I'll go through this slide now relatively quickly, but we'll start the next lecture with it very carefully because that's actually the business end of exponential families. If you have an exponential family distribution, here it is up here, that's the definition of such a distribution. It has this algebraic form. It's a distribution over some x with some parameters w. Then, you can do the same, this, you can sort of do an abstract form of this staring at the expression bit that we did for the beta and the Dirichlet and the Gaussian and all the other ones, and just see that there is, you can think of another distribution over W parameterized by alpha and nu, whose sufficient statistics are the, the natural parameters of the conjugate likelihood and the negative log partition function of the likelihood and invent parameters for them. And why is this the right thing to do? Because, it's, because clearly, 
if you multiply this expression with this expression, then you get a new expression of the form w times alpha plus phi of x. So you add up the sufficient statistics of the data. And new plus the number of observations you've made. So new is the counting variable, and alpha is the sufficient statistic variable. And the only thing you need to be able to use this, this is our function called g. On the first slide for conjugate priors, I said we need these two things, phi and g. Phi is the data processor, the sufficient statistics, and g is the inference engine. And the only thing we need in g is to know what this normalization constant is over this thing. Let's call it f. And if you know what this is, then you're done. And if you don't, then we have to think, and that's what we're going to do in the next lecture. So all of these individual distributions, they all go down, they all come, come back down to one smart person 100 or 200 years ago, staring at one particular such expression of this exponential family form, discovering that they knew how to construct the integral over the conjugate prior, maybe from a textbook, from a letter from their best friend, and then write a nice paper about it and attach their name to this distribution. It's basically the invention of an individual integral that gives rise to each of these, of these distributions. And why was that important in 1805? Because they didn't have computers. And this was important in 1920, in 1930, in 1960, even in 1990, because at the back end of your complicated Bayesian inference scheme, you wanted to have something tractable, where you just take the data, you do some pre-processing, you do some simple computation, and you're done. And even up until the 90s, there are a lot of papers in statistics and computational statistics that turns into machine learning that keep going, I've, I have this new cool way of very efficiently using data to construct some, some, uh, some posterior distribution and usually based on exponential family distributions. Because they translate the process of inference into two parts, into processing the data, sufficient statistics, and then doing Bayesian inference, which amounts to evaluating f, if you know f. But now it's 2023, and we have computers, so what we need to figure out is how much further we can go if we can push beyond completely tractable operations. So we'll think about that on Thursday. Here's the summary for today. Conjugate prior inference is the most efficient neat structure you want to look for that makes Bayesian inference tractable. Tractable in the sense that you pre-process the data and then you sum up a bunch of computed sufficient statistics and evaluate a known integral. The corresponding algebraic structure we need for this is that of an exponential family. We just discovered that there's a lot of them already. Wikipedia is full of them. A large part of statistics revolves around them, and I've even left out a lot of the interesting aspects about them. You've seen some examples of how we can use these to do Bayesian inference and to do predictive uh, estimation towards new data sets. And the main thing, the main challenge that this all comes down to is to build this function called g. So if we write the function g, we need an access to an integral, essentially. And next Thursday, when we're back here in this room, we'll actually translate this, try and translate this into like a skeleton for analytic Bayesian inference on simple variables in Python, or actually in sort of Jack's flavored Python. And hopefully that will help you think about the algebraic structures we care about. I do this because I want you to, to get a, a sense for the computational aspects of this. This entire lecture for the rest of this course will be about computational aspects of inference because that's what makes Bayesian inference hard. And it's also the last time we talk about these very, very simple types of data sets where we just make observations of individual real numbers or rates or even integers, or even binary random variables. OK, I hope that today's pace was a bit better, even though I forgot to take a break. So you're probably going to let me know. Um,
please give feedback. Currently, there's about a third of you who actually raises your, your phones and, and gives feedback. So I keep having to mention it. Maybe it's going to be a little bit more than a third at some point. Don't forget that on Monday is a public holiday, so that we won't be here. There's also no exercise sheet next week, but we'll be back here on Thursday next week, and then there'll be an exercise on the Monday afterwards. But you still have to submit your exercises by Monday, by the way, right? So the deadline for the exercise of this week is still next Monday, but then there is no exercise sheet next week. Thank you.